is Emil Kane and I am an Irish artist based in Denmark and Norway and this is my exhibition Intimate Expansive at the Rochester Art Centre. This room uh, is uh, still has a certain nod to um, architecture and design and so on within some of the, the drawings and paintings but there is um, a big emphasis on art history and essentially the um, the works uh, facing you as you come into the room uh, the work which is called To Begin to End which is based on a Samuel Beckett quote um, is a collection of many many works on paper which I've been making um, I guess over uh, close to the last uh, 17 or 18 years if not 20 years um, and this uh, installation is adapted to the space, so I, I change it each time I install it, and it sort of shrinks, shrinks and uh, grows as I, as I install it. It includes a lot of references to um, the architects that I've been talking about, uh, the Corbusier, Eileen Gray, uh, Philip Johnson, Lise van der Rohe, and so on. Um, but it also uh, connects with, with art history and uh, also especially with Irish art history going back to the early Christian period and even to the pre-Christian Celtic period in, in, uh, in Ireland. So there's a lot of works from uh, the National Museum in, in Ireland which I've drawn and I studied a joint honours degree and one of my main areas of, of uh, research was uh, Irish art history. The Black Mirror series is based on uh, an idea of how we engage with new technology as human beings and it's, kind of, it's almost a sort of anti-social media comment in that um, I'm concealing the face. The face is, as with things like Facebook, it's, it's your entry portal in terms of identity into this virtual space and um, I'm creating uh, these, uh, these kind of creatures that don't have uh, faces or their faces are concealed. So there's something kind of ominous about, about them in terms of their identity. Um, so uh, some of the double portraits in this is actually a process of um, me taking designer cloths, things like uh, Mari Meko designs, and asking my sons to uh, enshroud me with uh, them so they cover my head with these uh, um, cloths and then uh, take a photograph on a tripod of, of me. So the authorship is also kind of uh, complicated in that I don't see what's being taken and I become the subject. And then I do these airbrush paintings. And the, the reason I use airbrush with these and with the, the trees is that I'm interested in uh, the distance that the airbrush affords me, um, uh, both in a conceptual sense but also in a physical sense when I'm making them because my my hand doesn't touch the, the surface. Um, it's almost a kind of mechanical uh, process, but still uh, still dictated by, by my body and body movements. Uh, but also conceptually, it um, very much aligns itself with uh, not only photographic technology, but perhaps with the sort of idea of the computer printer or the inkjet print and, and so on. So they're, they're kind of hard to locate. It also allows me the opportunity to work with the, the, the notion of depth and focus because uh, again within photography which uh, is all consuming within contemporary society given the number of selfies we take and the number of photographs we take on a daily basis and upload to the cloud or to the internet um, it also affords me this uh, uh, opportunity to play with that uh, focus the, the camera has a fixed focus so you choose what you focus on with the airbrush, I'm able to adjust the focus all over the image um, simultaneously. So the foreground can be in focus and out of focus at the same time, just as the middle ground and the background. And this uh, gives a, a kind of subtly disorientating uh, effect. It also makes you question your own eyesight and uh, what you're looking at. And uh, I, I like that uh, disruption. And, the other works in the room uh, are, include the Ideal Collection, which is a comment on both being an artist and, and uh, 
trying to name one's influences, but by naming one's influences, uh, a certain complexity arises that doesn't necessarily give any answers, but maybe produces more questions. Um, but it also is a way of me to engage with this, uh, with the canon of art history, and also to, to comment on the art market and the way art is consumed, because essentially I, in my own way, uh, through this kind of appropriation of painting the works, I'm reducing them down to uh, so, sort of size of large postcards or to the size of uh, toys or models. Um, and what I wanted to do was by passing them through the, this filter of painting uh, to, to kind of uh, bring them all to the, to the same level where they can interact with each other and cut across time. There's, uh, I'd say, approaching 300 of them. We've got uh, around about 60 of them on display here. But I think in the in the the way I use uh, natural elements and trees, especially in the uh, paintings, by and large, that is definitely about the uncanny. You know, the typical idea of the Unheimlich is this idea that it has to be cozy in order to get a bit creepy. Um, so that's what I'm dealing with. You know, so. The simple subversion of changing a floor to deep red um, for me can, uh, you know, is it red marble? Is it a pool of blood? The other interior painting in, in, the, in the same line is from Mies van der Rohe's uh, Turgenev's house in um, the Czech Republic, and it formed one of the paintings uh, based on a novel, a fictional novel called The Glass Room which was based uh, on um, the, the Tugendhat Villa, using it as a kind of starting point, uh, the, the building of it, a fictional architect which was based on Mies van der Rohe, and then how it was uh, occupied by a Jewish family, then the Nazis took it over. So I would find it interesting that this idyllic and beautiful utopian space uh, could uh, be um, kind of used as a vehicle for this, um, these kind of uh, studies of dystopia.